Hi, welcome back to Mind Control. The first way to get focus is to find purpose. The way to find purpose is you must identify what it is that you have to be purposeful in. Right When you are struggling with what to do, who you are, what's your next move, you are in an identity crisis. You are struggling with just who you are. See, you have not discovered who you are. You have to discover who you are in order to move you forward. If no one ever gave you the directions, let me ask you something. When you get up and you get up in the morning, you go get in the car or you walk out your door, you have a destination in mind. If you go outside with no destination, what do you do? You just, you wander around. Once you don't have a destination, you are going to wander around. You cannot get in your car without a destination. Where, did you, where do you drive? So you are in an identity crisis, the same thing I was in. So you have to find your purpose. So let me help you with this. If you are in this situation, the solution is the first thing, you have to do the thing that God gave you. You just have to identify your gift. That's the first thing. Until you do that, you can forget it. You'll never find your purpose, you'll never know your mission, you'll never know the reason. So I think we're in an identity crisis. I think you have to identify who you are and what your real gift is and pursue the gift. The Bible says your gift will make room for you, put you in the presence of great men. That's what your gift do, that's God. That ain't Steve. I'm telling you what God say. You ain't gotta believe me, it's in your Bible. I'm just telling you the truth. I identified my gift. See, that's why when he says, Steve, you can sing. Whoa, hey, hold up man, and that's not what I do. I've identified my gift. I'm in a joke telling business. Your gift is like a tree trunk. Your gift is the trunk of a tree. On a tree, it has many branches. Now, because my gift is comedy, that's my tree trunk. That's what I was made for, the gift. Your, two things, your career is what you paid for. Your calling is what you made for. So God took this tree trunk and made a lot of branches. Comedy made me a movie, a TV star, a radio star, a, I could write books. But then what he made me for was to motivate people, to change people's lives by sending me through a process that was so hard for me to overcome. When somebody like you stands up and asks me a question, I know the answer without even thinking because I've been processed. I've been, I've been homeless, so I know exactly what you're feeling. You feel me? Mr. Shelf said to me, I don't think your current bank balance is a true indicator of your level of intelligence. I was happy to hear that. He said, I think you have plenty of talent and ability and that you're much smarter than your bank balance indicates. And that turned out to be true. I was much smarter. My question to him was, then why isn't my bank balance bigger? And he said, you don't have enough reason for accomplishing great things. If you had enough reasons, you could do incredible things. You have enough intelligence, but not enough reason. That's the key, if you had enough reason. In my years of study, I've also discovered this. Reasons come first, and answers come second. Life has a strange way of hiding all the answers and disclosing them only to people who have been inspired to look for them, who have reasons to look for them. Put another way, when you know what you want, and you want it badly enough, you will find ways to get it. The answers, the methods, the solution will become evident to you. Hey, what if you had to be rich? Are there any books and tapes on the subject? The answer is yes. There are plenty of good ones. But if you don't have to be rich, you probably won't read the books or listen to the tape. What drives us to find the answers is necessity. So work on your reasons first, answer second. Now, what are some of the reasons for doing well? It varies from person to person. I'm sure that if you did a little soul searching, you could come up with a fairly strong list of reasons why you want to accomplish great things. There are personal reasons, sometimes uniquely personal reasons. Some people do well for the recognition. Some do well because of the way it makes them feel. They love the feeling of being a winner. 
That's one of the best reasons. My mom this morning knew I wasn't feeling good. She goes, honey, do you need to cancel that talk? I'm like, mom, I can't cancel on these people. It's like, you work so hard. Why is it matter? I go, mom, I'm helping them. She goes, oh, then you need to go. Because they're about service. Okay, so in your life, I'll go a little bit a little bit more here, you guys. In your life, if you combine understanding your mess can be repurposed, understanding I'm just like you, understanding the RAS, understanding changing your identity, understand bending time, you have a shot. Combined with this industry, combined with the information you're getting. But if you don't change your identity, do you know how many people I've had as friends that got wealthy that aren't anymore? More than I have that are still wealthy. Do you know how many friends I have who lost a lot of weight and got in shape and aren't shaping? Do you know how many friends I have that had a great relationship and marriage that aren't in that relationship and marriage. Does this sound familiar to you? You want to know why? Their internal thermostat and all that crap back. I ain't going back. I know where I am. I got to change that thermostat. By the way, you change the thermostat for your association. You change the thermostat. By the way, associations read books, follow them on social media, listen to their podcasts, their audios, all that stuff. Subscribe to my podcast. It's on iTunes. Listen to my YouTube. It's all free. I don't touch. I make no money. This is work. My podcast cost me about a million dollars. I do it to help you. I'm here today to help you. I was paid to be here today, but it's one of the only things I do to get paid anymore to help I'm here to help. I'm here to change your life. I spent the first 45 years of my life building my legacy and my dream, and I want to spend the second half helping other people build there. I feel like it's my calling and my mission in my life is to help people. It's sort of my form of ministry. I trickle God in there just a little bit, but not enough to be offensive. I give people the tools, skills, and inspiration to do it. I want to change the world. I want a billion people to change their lives to be a force for good. And let me explain to you why. I think the world is more screwed up and divided than it's ever been in the history of mankind. You're either a Democrat or a liberal or a Republican or a this or a that or black against white if you're in our country right now evidently if you're a white male your enemy are brown people who are coming across our border right if that's not your enemy then if you're a christian your enemy is a muslim if that's not your enemy then if you're black your enemy is white privileged male right by the way really your enemy if they're a christian white privileged successful married male then they're really bad guys right and what we do is we enemy each other constantly in this world we're more divided than we've ever been people are broke they're struggling they want to blame somebody the bottom line is people don't like their lives they're not happy with their lives. They're looking for someone to blame. Politicians, Trump and Obama, I don't care who you like, they're both incredible at getting you to subtly blame someone else for your conditions. Those you know, the confidants in every person, not just every leader, every person needs a few confidants in your life with whom you can be transparent, and then you won't be so lonely all the time. This man is in cave because there's nobody walking with him. There's nobody who's got his rhythm. There's nobody who's got his pace. And then there are constituents. Constituents. And this is the vast majority. This is the big category of what happened in church. Constituents are distinctly different to confidants. Confidants are for you. Constituents are for what you are for. They line up with the cause. They're called to the cause. They join your church because you feed homeless people. They join your church because of your foreign mission. They join your church because you're going to heaven. They join your church because you believe in faith and you teach the word. They join your church. They are not for you now. They are not for you. They are for what you are for. They're going your way. They are for what you're for. What's the highway we came in on? What's the number? I find you're, you're on I-5, they're on I-5. You're going in the same direction, they're going your way. They are for what you are for. They're not for you. And you have to understand that because they're attracted to the direction you're going in. But if they see a car that will get them there quicker, they will leave you because they were never for you. They were for where you were going. And if somebody else can get them there quicker than you, they will hop out of your car and dive into their car and go down the road because they were never attracted to you. They were attracted to your direction. And these are constituents. They are for what you are for. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's nothing wrong with that until you mistake a constituent for alpha. And you have a personal relationship with a public person. And you think they are there for you. And they were never there for you. They were there for what you were for. And then there are comrades. The third category is comrades. Now, comrades are not for you. And they are not for what you are for. They are just against what you are against. They're comrades. They are attracted to you because you have a common enemy and they will be with you as long as the fight exists. But when the fight is over, they are gone. It's like the past election. I'm gonna be very careful because we get in politics, we'll all fight. But uh, in in the past election, when when McCain and and Hillary Clinton got together to attack Obama, McCain and Clinton wouldn't get together about nothing except they were both against Obama. Sometimes people only join you because you have a common enemy. They're comrades. They're with you in the struggle. And in the trenches, they're wearing your uniform. But when the fighting stops, you will be attacked in your own foxhole. If you bring a comrade too close to you, when your comrade gets through shooting at who you're shooting at, they will shoot you because they were never for 
for you. And they were never for what you were for. They were just against what you were against. You'd be surprised at the people who fight against stuff. Just all kinds of stuff. Abortion, same sex, marriage, all kinds of stuff. They're, they're against the same stuff, but they're not for each other. They join together in the fight. You, as a leader, have to know why people hooked up with you. Because if you misallocate a person into the wrong category, you will be brokenhearted and wounded and end up in the cage because you thought a constituent was a confidant, thought a comrade was a constituent. When the fight was over, they got shot in your own foxhole. And I don't care what you hear about on TV, there is no such thing as friendly fire. A bullet is a bullet. Where in the all fire bulimity did we get friendly fire from? Get closer. Uh, <laughs> friendly fire. There is no friendly fire. You shot me. What is a friendly bullet? A bullet going your hand and saying, I like you, you know? Whoa, you know, what's up with that? Because success without fulfillment is the ultimate failure. Who's with me on this, right? You make everybody else feel great. I mean, it's a horrible example. I hate it, but we all know an extraordinary spirit that took his own life just recently. Probably lit up more human beings than almost anybody alive when it comes to humor and joy. He made everybody else feel happy but himself. It's sad. You don't want that to be you. If there's any gift he can give besides his joy is the evidence of what you don't want to move towards. Nobody in this room is going to move towards that, but we do it at a little level. We die a little bit along the way by giving up what we really desire and believe in. And my goal is to make sure to see if we can wake that up. So, and by the way, fulfillment is as unique as there are people. Achievement, there's laws, right? You do this, this, money, there are laws. Your body, there's laws. We all have biochemical, special, unique identities, but there's certain fundamentals. If you do them in mass, you're going to be overweight. If you do them differently, you're going to be fit and strong. Same thing with money. But fulfillment is as unique as art. Art is what one person thinks is beautiful, somebody else can think is ugly, and that's perfectly fine. Have you ever gone to an art museum and you see this big red square and they go ten million dollars you go you gotta be kidding me ten million dollars for a freaking square i'll draw you a square but someone else no look at the texture the, the taste the flavor i can taste the paint from here they have a different way of being fulfilled right so those are the two kind of lessons of life so this is what i'd like to do to help you with today if you want to play with number one let's take a look at what will give you the edge who's up for having a competitive edge in anything you do say i and it's not bs and it's not positive thinking it's something you can test because the edge is what's going to get more out of you Second, I'd like to show you how to create a breakthrough. Who here has an area of your life where there's something you've struggled with for a while and you're sick of struggling with it and you're sick of making excuses and you want to actually change it today? Who's got one of those in your life? Say, ah! If you want to play full out, I can show you that. And the third element really affects the other two and it's really the one that affects business and life and that's the power of engagement. All of these are tied to engagement. Thank you so much for watching till the end. Don't forget to share your thoughts in the comments section. Please also like, subscribe, and share this video with your friends and families. Please watch our other motivational videos. Thank you again. Hi, welcome back to Mind Control, where we inspire and motivate you. Hope you enjoy the video. By not being prepared, you make the choice of getting caught in some of life's unpleasant circumstances. Be they rain, failures, economic losses, relationship losses, professional losses, personal losses. By not being prepared, thinking ahead, it's your choice. Now here's the other side of it. By being prepared, you increase your chances of success. You increase the likelihood. By being prepared, you increase your chances of success of seizing opportunities when they come your way, of being ready within yourself to take advantage of once-in-a-lifetime situations. Some people tend to blame others for their mistakes, blame others for their failures. Somebody says, it's not my fault the report isn't done, so-and-so didn't do their part. Of course it's your fault. It's your report too. It's your responsibility to see that everyone you delegated work to does their part. Now you can't control what others around you do, but it's in your own best self-interest that you stay on top of things, especially if it's going to affect your future. You think your boss cares that John didn't do his part? You think he sees John as the bad guy? Of course not. All he sees is that the report isn't done, bottom line. Be responsible for the things that affect you. You can make sure you're more responsible by checking in with those people who are working with you, 
the people who make up your team. You can be more responsible by saying, hey, John, how are you doing with your part? Do you need some help? Can we put somebody else in here to help you finish? Now, if John consistently doesn't handle his part, you've got to replace John. If he isn't doing his share, you've got to find somebody that will, or what? It will negatively affect you. You can't wake up in the morning that the project is due hoping and wishing that John has done his part. No, you've got to be responsible because it's going to affect your career too. Now, my approach to my better future very early on in my career was to just go through the day with my fingers crossed. And I used to say something like, I sure hope things will change for the better. Then here's what I found out. They're not going to change. Somebody says, well then, how will my life ever change? Answer, when you change. When you change, when you get better, it'll get better. If you change, it'll all change. Don't put it on someone else. Hope that someone else will change it for you. Take responsibility for yourself. Take personal responsibility. You can't change the circumstances or the seasons or the wind, but you can change your reading habits. You can change whether or not you go for the skills, burn the midnight oil, turn yourself around, multiply your value by two, three, five, ten. That you've got charge of. That you have control of. You don't have control of the constellations, but you've got control over whether or not you go to night school take adult classes, learn some new skills, you have control over that. And if you don't, that's your fault. You've got to take personal responsibility. You've got to be self-reliant. Nobody else can change your life, alter your ambitions, pave a golden road for you. But you can. It's up to you. Be responsible for yourself. Learn to reap the harvest without complaint. This is a sign of growing maturity. And here's where it comes from, taking full responsibility. Take full responsibility for everything you do. Be responsible to yourself. It's your crop. Whatever your paycheck is, take full responsibility. You say, well, it's my employer. No, it's not your employer. You can become twice as valuable, three times as valuable. Burn the midnight oil, learn some more skills, bring more value to the marketplace. I'm telling you, whatever your harvest is, take it without complaint. Whenever you prepare correctly, taking all of the steps you're supposed to take, doing everything in your power to stay on track, whenever your preparations lead to success, achieving your goals, you reinforce the disciplines that got you there. Success leads to reinforcement of the proper disciplines. If what you're doing is working, keep doing it. If what you're doing isn't working, change it. How can you isolate what's working for you and what isn't? How can you make sure that you are reinforcing your positive disciplines? Well, if it isn't apparent, easy to see right away. If what you're doing is happening in such small increments, that you're not sure if you're on track, then you need to be writing it down. You need to keep a journal anyway. But if you really aren't sure that what you're doing is making measurable progress, you need to keep a written record. You need to write down everything that may be relevant in your day. What you did, who you saw, what you felt, how it may or may not affect you now and in the future. The best way to track your activities of the day is to write them down. The best way to track your activities of the week is to write them down. The best way to analyze your progress through the year is to have written it down. Why? So you can look back on it. Because by keeping a written record of your life, you will be more accountable. By putting into writing the action steps that you have planned, you will easily see what works and what doesn't. Most people just try to get through the day. Never writing anything down. Never keeping track of their progress along the way. Never really knowing if they are doing all they can to reach their goals. 
to drive their ambition. But gifted people learn to get from the day. They don't let a day end without picking up some valuable experience, some emotional content, some idea that may positively affect their future. To get the most from a day, to learn the most from a day, you need to be able to reflect on the day. And how can you reflect on a day unless you record it in history? How can you possibly reflect on a week unless you can look back and analyze it? How can you learn from past mistakes and bask in the past successes unless you write it all down? There's something magical in writing out a problem. It's almost as though when you start writing it out, you start figuring out ways to make it work. Perhaps the magic is that when you write it down, you can now be objective. You can start to see objectively where you fit into the picture. You can start to see if you are being responsible, if you are being self-reliant. You are pondering it. You are trying to figure it all out. The fact that it is now on paper actually creates a space between you and the problem. And in this space that you have created, now solutions have room to grow. You see, writing about events that occur helps you to understand exactly what is happening. When we describe life to ourselves only in our minds, our imaginations tend to feed back false information about how things are, distorted information. Sometimes our creativity can create scenarios that really don't exist at all if we keep the information just in our mind. But by writing it all down, we now can become more factual, more accurate, more realistic, more logical. And then as we reread what we have written, we create a new picture in our mind. And once we see things as they are, rather than how we think they are, we can see our way to make them better. It's all part of being responsible. It's all part of seeing things objectively in order to fully understand the steps that we must take to make things better. Let's take a few minutes to talk about the importance of knowing yourself enough to be your best cheerleader. You know, when you thought you were doing what you were supposed to do and were misinformed, the times you thought you had it all laid out and it just didn't work, the times when you burned the midnight oil day after day and it didn't seem to help, it didn't seem to change the end result. These are the times that you have to rely on your own self-encouragement. And there are two ways to use self-encouragement. Number one, take responsibility for the missed opportunity or the misrepresentation. Learn from the fact that even though your client wanted it one way and you presented it the right way, it didn't work. Be prepared for the letdowns that happen every so often. Know that this lost opportunity just sets you up better for the next one. Realize that you can make the necessary alterations next time. Make the changes that will make the difference. Study your mistakes and learn from them. Don't dwell on the mistakes. Acknowledge them. Learn from them. Encourage yourself that you're smarter than your bank account leads you to believe. The second way to use self-encouragement, remind yourself that you're bound to get better. Don't get down on yourself. Don't beat yourself up. It's the next opportunity that matters, not the last one, the next one. Now, the last one matters only in that you must learn from your mistakes. But the next one gives you the opportunity to show that you have learned from your mistakes. You can do it better next time. You just have to practice, 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 keep trying, keep trying until, until what? Until you've got it down. If you figured out what went wrong last time, then you know how to make it right next time. If you figured out what it was in your presentation that didn't work, don't say that next time. If you figured out that the reason you didn't close the deal this time was because you didn't have all the facts and figures in place, have all the facts and figures in place next time. Don't beat yourself for messing up. Pat yourself on the back for figuring it out. You need to encourage yourself. You need to pump yourself up. You need to be your own cheerleader. Why? 
Because you can't wait and hope that someone else will come along and cheer you up, make you feel better, tell you that you'll do better next time. You have to rely on yourself. You have to have faith in yourself and your ability to figure out what works and what doesn't, what's right and what's wrong. You have to have the inner belief that everything you're doing, you're doing for a positive outcome in the future. You have to encourage yourself with future successes. Number one way to use self-encouragement, take responsibility for missed opportunities and study your mistakes. Number two, don't get down on yourself. Encourage yourself with your future. Encourage yourself with your goals, your dreams, your ambition. Knowing that you've got a plan, knowing that you're taking the right steps, knowing that you're going to do it until. When you miss an opportunity, are unprepared for an opportunity or suffer a setback while realizing your goals, when you miss out, you need to encourage yourself by immediately getting back into line. There's an old cowboy saying, fall off a horse seven times and you're a real cowboy. If you fall off a horse, get right back on. If you fall off track, get right back on. If you fall away from your disciplines, get right back to them. We'd like to thank you so much for watching till the end. Don't forget to share your thoughts in the comments section. Please also like, subscribe, and share this video with your friends and families. Please watch our other motivational videos. Thank you again. It's not about clearing out your closet. It's about the transformation of your mind. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. Do you have a mind to change? Do you have the mindset to be blessed? You have to decide to be blessed. You got till midnight to get rid of every poison that's hindering you, every inflexibility that's stopping you from what God is about to pour into your life. Woe be unto you if you go into another year and waste another year with the old mentality while somebody's in the hospital begging God for the opportunity that you have right now. You better step into this moment. As soon as you decide to stop looking for answers in other people and click the heel to your mind and set your affections on things that are above, you could have been free years ago. When God shows us something, we compare it to our previous point of reference. And then we start consulting our resources, and, and God wants to bring us new relationships. But watch this. If you're not ready for new people in your life, you will bring the same patterns to the new relationships that you brought to the old relationships. And we literally keep people out of our lives that God wants to send because we are holding on to the hurts from the one who have already left. Do not be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Transformation doesn't come because you show up here for an hour and 20 minutes. You'll be transformed by the renewing of your mind. But this word renewing is the same word as renovating. How many of you know you can't renovate a house in an hour and 15 minutes? If you're going to renovate a house, you got to kick some walls down. You got to pull some tiles up. You got to get into the mess of it. And that's what we got to do in our brain. You have to decide that you're going to be in control and that you are going to do what you want to do. You are the machine and you can control the machine. Weakness doesn't get a vote. Sadness, no vote. Frustration, no vote. I don't even give my temper a vote. You have to learn how to shut your mind against strifeful thoughts. And as soon as they come, you need to say, this is going nowhere. I've been there, done that, and I'm going to change my mind, get in agreement with God, and let God take care of the situation. The next time that you're feeling weak, or you're feeling lazy, or you're feeling emotional, tell them you are declaring martial law on your mind. You're declaring mind control.
and impose what you want on your brain and use that mind control to move your life where you want it to be. A whole set of circumstances can bend you over. What your daddy did to you, what your mama didn't do for you, can bend you over and keep you an emotional cripple for a long time. There's some people here who are still spinning from things that's happened years ago, years ago, and you can't shake it. It's got you crippled and you can't straighten up. Every time you straighten up, you can't only go so far. Because it's not only a problem of health, it's a problem of habit. It, you're used to being bent over. Because you can be bent over so long, you don't even know how to straighten up. And things aren't straightening out. They aren't getting better. You remain crippled in your situation. Sometimes you got to talk to yourself. Sometimes you got to say to yourself, now you know better than that. Sometimes you got to talk to yourself. When you see somebody you don't like, or somebody who gets on your nerves, you got to talk to yourself. You got to talk yourself into some stuff. And then you got to talk yourself. <laughs> you got to tell yourself, don't do it. Don't go that way. Danger, dangerous intersection. You have to be able to talk yourself out of some stuff because a whole lot of stuff I would not have gotten into had I talked to myself. We've got a chance to grow like never before, but I'm telling you, there's going to be many enemies that's going to try to prevent us. Whatever threatens you, I'm asking you to threaten it back. Take care of your responsibility. If somebody wants to destroy your chances for a good future by their negative talk, negative thinking, putting it all down, I'm telling you, walk away if you have to, walk away. Whatever threatens you, threaten it back. Whatever threatens your opportunity, threaten it back. Now, some of our enemies are on the outside. But here's the most important thing to understand. Some of our enemies are on the inside. You've got to do battle with your own indifference. And you've got to learn not only to nourish your values, you've got to learn to do battle with your enemies. I'm asking you to have some faith, have some courage, believe. Drive your doubts into a small corner. Don't let them loose like a mad dog. Drive you into a small corner. Don't doubt the future. Don't doubt the possibilities. And here's the most important one of all. Don't doubt yourself. If I've got miracle working power to change my life, so do you. If I can grow, you can grow. I'm asking you, don't sell yourself short. But I wonder, have you taken the time to think about why am I doing this in the first place? Am I trying to prove something to someone who disrespected me 10 years ago, who isn't even paying attention to my life anymore? Why am I posting this to impress people who follow me on social media that don't even really know me? What is my reason for doing what I'm doing? At the start of the day, you need to set your mind for victory. Don't let just any thoughts play. You have to think thoughts on purpose. If you wake up and just think whatever comes to mind, thoughts will tell you, you have too many problems. You're too tired. Nothing good is going to happen today. If you don't set the tone for the day, negative thoughts will set them for you. Before you check the phone, before you see what the weather is like, you need to think on purpose power thoughts, victory thoughts, can-do thoughts. No matter what happens to you, it ain't over. As long as God wakes you up, that means he ain't through with you yet. And if he wakes you up, you got a shot to correct it and get it right. And he kept waking me up. So I figured, okay, God wakes you up. That also means that he has something for you that you've yet to receive. You can take my car, I could get another one. You can take my house, I could get another house. But when you take my time, you have taken something from me that is totally irreplaceable. Even if you are 40 or 50 or 60 or 70 doesn't matter. You're in the game now and that's what counts. And all those quote unquote wasted years, they, they weren't wasted because you learned. Learned about what it's like to be weak and the knowledge that you learned about those things is fuel to make sure that it never happens again. Because you know, you know what is out there and you know how bad it can get. I say you embrace what you learned from the weekdays. Let them make you even stronger and you use your own personal 
transformation that you've made in life, use that to help other people transform and get on the path as well. If you know what it is to have the kind of pain that feels as if you cannot be confident, if you know what it is to be at the end of your rope and feel like your life is over and you've got questions that cannot be answered and you're confused and you're uncertain, you need to learn this verse, they that sow in tears shall reap in joy. I will never uh, forget there have been many opportunities in my life that I have grappled with grief and pain so unbearable and so overwhelming that I thought that I would never smile again. I've seen days that were so dark for me that I thought there could not possibly be a silver lining in the clouds that hung over my head. I've seen days and weeks and months that drug me so low that I gave up all hope of getting up again. But in the midst of all of that despair and that trouble and that trauma and that pain there was in the basement of my soul this one word when when should you start the day as soon as you have it finished plan the day the best you can leaving plenty of room for improvising and surprises and all the stuff that happens during the course of the day. But if you've planned a good, productive day, now you start that day, you can't believe how much more valuable your time will be. Next, don't start the month until you have it finished. The places to go and the people to see and the productivity and the sales and the customers and the development and all the rest of what you want to accomplish during the course of 30 days. And then here's the big one. This is really challenging. Don't start the year until you have it finished. To the best of your ability, it can't be finished like minute by minute. But in terms of the sweep of what you want to accomplish, make sure that that's set and ready to go. And it might get all upset. It might get torn up and you do a new one. You make so much progress the first 90 days that now you've got, you've multiplied it all by two by three. Because that happened to me. I thought, wow, here's how, this is going to be a great year. By the time I'd finished the third month, I'm rolling. So many things are happening. I revised my whole year's plan. Don't let anything overly bug you. Because you remember now, you don't have to do anything. Someone says, well, I gotta get a handle on my time. The answer is no, you don't. If you want to let it all go, you can let it all go. Somebody says, you ought, you ought, you ought. Jot this down, ignore all the you oughts, or you should. Take charge of your life. Take charge of your time. Take charge of your resources, which we're going to talk about next. Take charge of your health. You're the one that's responsible for it. It's not a requirement of society that you not have a heart attack and take care of your family, but you must make it a requirement of yourself. You will be okay. There's nothing has been wasted. Like I say, successful people don't make the right decisions, they make their decisions right. And you have an opportunity right now to make things right inside and out. When you say you're depressed, you've got to understand that depression is the opposite of expression. So what you're literally doing is stuffing down and depressing something that wants to come up and rise up. I wouldn't be surprised if you had like jaw, ear, or neck pain having to do with expressing yourself, speaking your truth. So, yeah, you're depressing yourself. Stop it. Speak up. Speak your truth. Now, all right, once you get that off your chest, now it's time to turn the flashlight in and discover what your truth is. We are living in a generation of the dumbing down of ideas because we have traded effectiveness for busyness. We are so busy and we think because we're busy, we're effective. But I want you to challenge your schedule for a minute and ask yourself, are you really being effective? Or is your life cluttered with all kinds of stuff that demands you and drains you and stops you from being your highest and best self? And are you substituting busyness and all the chaos that goes along with busyness from being effective? It's easy to get faked out by being busy. Guy comes home at night all exhausted, falls in the chair and says, Oh, I've been going, going, going. Here's the big question. Doing what? It's not the going, going, going. Some people are going, 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 and they're doing figure eights. So don't mistake movement for achievement. There's a lot of things you could take from me and I could make it. You could take my suit, I got another one. You could take my car, I could get another one. You could take my house, I could get another house. But when you take my time, 
You have taken something from me that is totally irreplaceable. We do everything except the most important thing is to value our time. It takes time to be creative. You were meant to be creative. You have creativity. If you had time, you would be creative. Better have a valued goal, because otherwise you can't get any positive motivation working out. And so the more valuable the goal, in principle, the more the micro processes associated with that goal start to take on a positive charge. Well, you get up in the morning and you're excited about the day, you're ready to go. What you do is you specify your long-term ideal. You do that in some sense as a unique individual. You want to specify goals that make you say, if that could happen as a consequence of my efforts, it would clearly be worthwhile. The question always is, why do something? Because doing nothing is easy. You just sit there and you don't do anything. That's real easy. And then the next question might be, well, where should you look for worthwhile things? And one would be, well, you could consult your own temperament. So you do a structural analysis of the subcomponents of human existence. And you need a family. You need friends. Like, you don't need to have all these things, but you better have most of them. Family, friends, career, educational goals, attention to your mental and physical health, etc. You know, those are that's what life is about. And if you don't have any of those things well then all you've got left is misery and suffering so that's a bad that's a bad deal for you don't mistake courtesy for consent if somebody's pleasant and they nod you say oh they're gonna buy no they're courteous you can't mistake courtesy for consent now here's a big one concentration I had to learn this all those years ago I'm in the shower trying to compose a letter found it turns out to be a strange letter so here's what I learned to do Save the work till you get to the office. Save the work till you get to the work. Don't try to get to the office on the way to work. On the way to work, enjoy the way. In the shower, enjoy the shower. Then go to work when you get to work. Concentration. Learn to say no. I'm telling you, in such a social society we have now, it's so easy to try to be a nice person saying yes, yes, yes to everything. Find yourself overloaded. Now you got to call and make the, well, gosh, you know, all the time it takes to back out of something that you should, said yes to too quickly. Here's what might be better. I don't think so, but if that changes, I'll call you. Little things you can use not to commit, overcommit yourself. But once you set up that goal structure, let's say, and that's really who it is that you're trying to be. You aim at that. And then you use everything you learn as a means of building that person that you want to be. And, and I really mean want to be. I don't mean should be, even those things, those things are going to overlap. That's fine, except you'll fail all the time then. You just won't know it until you've failed so badly that you're done. And that can easily happen by the time you're 40. I would recommend that you don't let that happen. Okay, so once you get your goal structure set up, you think, okay, if I could have this life, looks like that might be worth living. Anxiety provoking and threatening, and there's gonna be some suffering and loss involved in all of that. The goal is to have a vision for your life such that all things considered, that justifies your effort. Then you turn down to the micro routines. It's like, okay, well, this is what I'm aiming for. How does that instantiate itself day to day, week to week, month to month? And that's where something like a schedule can be unbelievably useful. It's like, make a damn schedule and stick to it. It's not a bloody prison. Set the damn schedule up so that you have the day you want. That's the trick. It's like, okay, I've got tomorrow. If I was gonna set it up so it was the best possible day I could have, what would it look like? 